Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism, as you know, is very similar, coming from exactly the same region. <clears throat> the second source is Greek source. And I said that Greece gave us basically culture. And culture is unique contribution of Greeks. They gave us philosophy, they gave us science, they gave us art, theater, dance, music. This is what we call culture. The way how man thinks, asking questions, and emphasizing questions to which many answers were given, and they were not disturbed by it. You know, this is a great sign, you know, when you ask questions and people give you different answers and you don't get upset. You don't pull a gun, you know, and, yeah. and say, yeah, I'm right, I always was right. And it seems to me you, you disagree with me, you know. So, you know, this is what Greeks gave us. This is very valuable contribution to human culture. The third source were Romans. Romans gave us civilization, uh, how civilian lives and can live together with the other civilian together in a city, what kind of problems there are, problems of water, <coughs> transportation, uh, organization, laws, this is what Romans were great in. Also concept of military and the way how social order can be militarily organized. It is a completely different source than that of the Greeks. At the end of antiquity, Romans conquered the whole world, known world for them, whole well, Mediterranean Sea. agree with me or else I'll pull my gun. Yeah, yes. It, no compromise, you know. And uh, it was a dirty word to compromise with Romans, you know. And <clears throat> so they were superior power. They lasted about 600 years. During the second half, they never realized that they were falling apart. You know. Carnevale continued, you know, and, and they danced and were happy. And, and they even had slogans like carpe diem, catch this very day, squeeze out of it everything you can. There won't be any tomorrow. Who cares for tomorrow? <coughs> and, <clears throat> They destroyed their own agriculture because they needed soldiers. They didn't notice it. So it went on and on. Greeks were the only ones who contributed to education of citizens by making him cultural. There are events which uh, they introduce Olympic Games, 776 BC. Last Olympic Games were at the beginning of 6th century. Olympic Games were closed by Emperor Justinian. It lasted seven, uh, 12, more than 12 centuries. Plato's Academy was introduced in Athens in 4th century BC, lasted until 5th century AD, closed by Emperor Justinian. Alexandrian school, the great first scientific institution of antiquity, was introduced by Alexander the Great in 3rd century BC, closed in, in 5th century by Emperor Justinian. So everything what Greeks produced was 
closed at the beginning of 6th century, 5th, 6th century. So it tells you that the world was radically changing. Yeah. So there was a general belief that less you know, more you can achieve and closer you are to God. And this very concept continued. I was stronger and stronger. There was no room for education. It is very char characteristic that the great woman leader of Alexandrian school, Hypatia, <coughs> was killed by Christian mobs, dragged through the street of Alexandria. And this was the end of Greek culture. So it went on for about 200 years. And here is a remarkable moment, which uh, I call the beginning of Renaissance. Western mankind must have gotten tired, and the leader of the Western mankind, Charles the Great, must have realized that it cannot go on. Surrounded by advisors, he didn't know what to do because he himself subscribed to it. And here is something remarkable what happened. We don't know who advised him how to renew the educational standards of Greeks. He, did, he was a Christian. You would expect that he will go and ask theologians to help him to reintroduce education. He sent his envoys to York in England. They were in outskirts of, of Western Europe. There were still schools which were teaching ancient learning mostly in Ireland and England. In New York, there was a learned monk called Alcuin. It was the man who was invited by Charles the Great to come to Aachen, in today's Germany, to establish the foundation of education. Now, now think about it. A Christian leader tries to renovate the foundation of education. There is nobody around him, you know, who would use Christian documents. It is Alcuin who is invited, who is monk to, and who comes back to the continent and introduces new ideas at that time, new, uh, completely new ideas. These ideas are trivium and quadrivium. Trivium of Greek sophists, quadrivium of Pythagoras. Christian monk brings ancient learning. It is embraced, he becomes the most important advisor to Charles the Great, later moves to school of St. Martin in Tours and establishes first schools which will be teaching the ancient Greek foundation of learning. Four Pythagorean disciplines dealt with the mind. Arithmetics, concept of number, geometry, concept of number in plane, uh, astronomy, concept of 
of number in space and time. Music, concept of number in time. Concept of number, what is concept of number? Where it is coming from? From human mind. Of course, it was not so easy to invent this mathematical philosophy, which simply states, answers the question of, of Greeks. What is everything coming from? What is the underlying substance out of which everything comes from? There were others contemporary with Pythagoras who said, it is water. That the other was, no, no, fire, fire. They said, wait a moment, air. And Pythagoras says, guys, it's number. <laughs> It's number. Number is essence of this universe. And he creates a philosophy of number. Everything is number. You see how we have inherited this tradition of Pythagoras up to our own times. Everything is number. Unless you can number it, it is not. <clears throat> so Pythagoras gave us these four disciplines. This is what Alcuin introduced in Aachen in 7th century AD. Next discipline, we have trivium, three disciplines of sophists. These three disciplines were also dealing with product of the mind, grammar. You have to drill your mind in grammar, in logic, and in oratory art. These three disciplines were produced within the framework of different Greece. Greece which celebrated victory over Persians. And there was a completely new trend. No more asking questions where everything is coming from, but how to be successful. And how to be successful means you have to know how to fight in democracy, how to speak, how to convince everybody what is the case. They produce a philosophy which states, man is the measure of all things. The way he measures his death is what is, but he has to have a strength, power, in order to say what is the case, he has to be powerful. This is a completely different way Greeks produced, you know, to be successful at any cost. They were the first teachers who received money for education. More you paid, more music you got. So this is the concept of sophistic teaching. This was very important to improve the mind, but as you see, it can be very easily misused. Sophists received a very bad name in the history of Western world. In part, they were responsible for death of Socrates. They produced politicians who were responsible for Socrates death of Socrates. So Plato built a monument for them in his dialogues, and they became kind of people who should be kept away. They were rehabilitated in 19th century in the United States and regarded as prototype of philosophers. 
successful people. It penetrated our system of laws. Uh, today's advertisement, this is run by sophists. And nobody dares to say anything against it. See, this final victory of sophists in today's society. So, <clears throat> Alcuin introduces these elements in Carolingian Renaissance. This is the beginning of what will follow during Middle Ages. So there is a new impetus, you know, that man can be educated. What he does with it is up to him. So we will start educating people in these seven liberal arts, three plus four. So Christian society acquires a new backbone from antiquity. In due time, there will be a new organization of these seven disciplines, and they have to incorporate new aspects of striving Christian society. There were many elements like uh, later, during the Middle Ages, uh, there was an attempt to liberate Jerusalem. This was a great goal of Christianity, to liberate Jerusalem. And as it happens very often in history, you set your goal and you forget that the goal has many implications. Implications of crusades were that village boys were recruited and became soldiers. Up to that time, they traveled two, three miles, and when they traveled somewhere, they kissed everybody goodbye. You know, it was a great distance. Now, these village boys are members of an army which will march through Europe to Jerusalem. And you will see other people, how other people live. All of a sudden, you are no more this village boy. You are a really experienced guy, you know, who has seen the world. You know, the Christian leaders did not anticipate that, you know, just like we don't anticipate what is going to happen when we start a war against somebody. You know, we started usually by people who never were soldiers. How could they impl imply, you know, what is going to happen? So. It started changing Christian society from within. The man was being changed. He became experienced. You cannot give him stories, you know, before when he lived in his village. He has seen the world and now <laughs> those who came back were different people. In our modern time, we call it social change, which is not apparent to leaders. So Christianity was changing from within. Uh, educational system was changing. Uh, the continent was under the spell of thinking of antiquity within Christianity. Christian leaders, it says something about impotence of, of Christian thinking. In order to establish itself as a powerful movement, it needed a philosophical <coughs> summary of the teaching, what is important, and how to organize this teaching. The first philosopher of Christianity became Plato. They did not ask him. You know. St. Augustine, who lived in 
fourth and fifth century, took Plato's teaching, set it into Christianity, and organized Christian teaching according to teaching of Plato. Plato's concept of Christianity was otherworldly. He never anticipated that he will be used by Christianity. And there were other problems Christians had in those days. With lack of learning, this whole Platonic concept of Christianity was too weak, you know, later, as we see, to fight against Muslims. Muslims who started their new history in 7th century AD had amazing intellectual class. And this intellectual class adopted Aristotle, pupil of Plato, as their central philosopher. So Aristotle does, without being asked, became the backbone of Muslim intellectual renaissance. Aristotle was a realist. He disagreed with Plato about concept of universals. As a realist, he sees the world consisting of things which are in front of him. For Plato, the true world was up there. This very world was just a replica of the upper world, but not so good, just uh, a kind of fake. So these two types of thinking inf influenced tremendously Christianity, which was otherworldly, Muslim movement, which is down to earth. Muslim, as soon as they got organized, they continued along the coast of Africa and came up to Gibraltar and jumped over to Spain. You can imagine that Christians were alarmed. Now, what to do again? Uh, under these circumstances, uh, during the 13th century, Western Christianity produced a, a great man, Thomas Aquinas. He decided that it is high time to replace Plato by Aristotle thus acquiring a new foundation of Christianity, which will be realistic. But if you play a new game with religion from up down to the earth, there are implications. You have a different society you will be facing pretty soon. So. <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas helped Western Christianity to make a stand against Muslim movement in Spain. But at the same time, the whole movement of Christianity acquired a new way of thinking, realistic way of thinking. And from that moment on, you cannot stop it. You start changing people in a new way. You don't see how far it will go in the future. Hand in hand with that, education was organized in a new way. Out of seven liberal arts, there were concept of university. And this university was based on the continent on concept of uh, Mathesis Universalis, universal matter. We will teach students universal matter of this universe. 
we will introduce students into largest possible concepts within which they will see the particular individuals. Deductive method will be supervising this whole edifice of the big world. This is concept of Plato, concept of Aristotle. Later, it comes in Western continental education as a concept of world view, Welt and Chao. So the continent will have a goal to educate people that they recognize particular within larger context. So you will be educated in large, largest possible context within which you will understand how things behave. In other words, you will never be lost. This is the purpose of worldview, Weltanschauung. At the same time, there is a different view which we notice at this time coming from England. Britishers were always aside from Western continental development. Their tendency in thinking was that they trusted more senses, and they were skeptical about reason, which can play all kinds of games with you, you know. And so let's trust our five senses. And here is the emergence, you know, of the conflict, which later became a very important conflict in the way how we learn about the world we live in. The continent had the preferable Platonic, Platonic and Aristotelian concept that reason is, in Greek tradition, the superior instrument which help us to work with senses, get the senses together, categorize them and put them into a larger system and always supervising, you know, the sensory experience. This is a kind of continental platonic dogma. All education will be geared towards this very goal. Now, who would care for nonsense when we have sense? So British culture produced empirical look at the world empirical collection. You go and you look how things are. You write down how things are. You collect the same things and all crowds are black. Uh, this is black, black, another one is black. 120 black. All of them are, all crows are black. And it will take a long time before somebody comes. To, how can you say all? What kind of sense sees all? There is no sense. You make a jump, you know, be careful. You know. So empirical knowledge is bound on actual sensory input which you can generalize. And the basic problem is that you can never talk about all because class of all things is not experience. But the British tradition was so powerful in their education that they trusted it. They produced the greatest thinkers in this very tradition of belief in senses. From 11th, 12th century, up to 16th century. At the time of great Newton, 
he was a brilliant man, one of the greatest who ever lived. But after he formulated his new theory, you know, he made a serious mistake. He said, hypothesis non fingo. I do not pretend to give you a hypothesis. Don't think that this is a hypothesis. This is how things really are. He was mistaken. He didn't know about it. You see the British tradition? Walked from within and misled him completely. His gravitational laws was a hypothetical description of the world. But he was so sure that this is the case that he would never admit, you know, that it is something else than reality. There is another great man who approximately at the same time, John Locke. John Locke is a great empirical philosopher who summarized British thinking very elegantly. He said, there is nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses. So we don't have anything in our intellect what has not been delivered into our intellect by the way of senses. You see Newton, this is a philosophical religion of British empiricism. When, I mentioned it already, when Newton invented calculus, he was waiting and waiting before he published it. It was done in such an awkward way, you know, that it was difficult to be understood by other people. On the continent, there was a great German philosopher, Leibniz, who at the same time invented calculus, too, which was more elegant, clearer to teach. And he was the man who answered John Locke. He answered it in a very elegant way. He said, oh, Mr. Locke, you are so right that there is nothing in human intellect what has not been prior in senses, but excuse me to add a little bit to it, with the exception of the intellect. <laughs> you know, this little addition changes the entire game. Shortly after that, there was a great British thinker uh, who never succeeded at home, who never was able to get a job because he went too far from this intellectual religion of British people. It was David Hume, one of the sharpest modern minds. He analyzed the process of how we acquire knowledge. He analyzed process of causation, how we explain causally everything. And he dared to say, everything can be different. Sun doesn't have to rise tomorrow. And people were crazy, my God, you know, how can you, sun doesn't have to rise. No, nothing has to be according to inductive series we have experienced before. The future does not, resemble, does not have to resemble my collection of data. The future doesn't have to be so that I expect it. Everything can be otherwise. This was too much, you know, for this classical British empiricist. He could not get away with it. He didn't get a job at any university. You know, 
you don't let our youngsters be taught, you know, by, by this kind of teacher. He has nothing to teach. The Bishop of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, uh, kind of excommunicated him. You know, these are crimes. And it was David Hume who alarmed a German thinker who lived in, in a city of Königsberg. It was Immanuel Kant. And Kant himself said, I was alarmed, disturbed, and awakened by David Hume that there must be something radical done about how it works within our mind. What are the senses and reason doing? Who controls whom? He established his whole life producing a unifying philosophy of theory of knowledge where senses and reason are integral. He gives you a feeling described in a superior Germanic way that you are getting sick out of it in detail, everything in detail. It is like a big mill, you know, we are getting grain from outside, you know, and then if we get flour and, and then uh, uh, out of flour, we make cakes and bread, and at the end, beautiful loaves of bread come. You know, this is how he described our mind with senses and final products. So it was a long way from this naive belief of British empiricists. And here is a tradition of thinking which uh, Greeks invented. In logic, there are two large fields, deduction and induction. You can now sense that British embraced induction, and all their great thinkers were contributing to induction. Francis Bacon was the last one, but Stuart Mill in 19th century was still inductivist. You know, deduction is deducing from principles the details to particulars. It is the uh, uh, concept of syllogism, the classical Example is, uh, all men are mortals. Socrates is a man, therefore, Socrates is mortal. You know, inductivist would say, Joe Doe was born, lived, and died. Joe Crow was born, lived, and died. And Mary, stubborn, was born, lived, and died. I can say that all people are mortal inductively because they were born, lived, and died. And now he was, wait a moment, you cannot jump to all people. You can never have all people. He said, I beg your pardon, you know. Will you accept my conclusion that it is highly probable that all people who were born, lived, will die? Well, that sounds better. You see, this would be the inductive conclusion with probability. But man was always striving for certainty. So deduction at the same time gives certainty. You find it in structure of mathematical thinking. Greek mind was striving for certainty. And they invented a concept 
which is necessary for deduction, concept of axiom. You base everything on axioms. What are axioms? You don't know? Clear, distinct, self-evident truth. Oh, clear, distinct, self-evident truth. Of course, you would never dare to challenge it, you know, because you would say that you are ignoramus, you know. Then you said, you know, I think there are certain things are not, it is not clear to me. Well, that's your problem. Axioms are clear, distinct, self-evident truth. Write it down. What are axioms? And for more than 2,000 years, students will jump up and say, clear, distinct, self-evident truth. A. So it will go on and on. It is a very serious business, you know. You know. So the whole tradition, <laughs> this deductive tradition is based on definition of axioms, which is defined this way. For millennia, we will teach it in school. We teach it in school so that everybody can learn it in such a way that he is like a little parakeet, you know. He will repeat it and he will get his A. Nobody has to think. So this is a great achievement of our education. For millennia, we teach people not to think but we give them good grades for it. <laughs> Is our constitution sort of based on the preposition that all men are created equal? We hold these truths to be self-evident. Exactly. Yeah, and if it's self-evident, then it doesn't have to be proved because by definition, yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. And you say, a moment, maybe some of them are more equal. <laughs> yeah. 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 It gets more complicated. Oh, oh, uh, maybe some of them are not people. Or if somebody comes along and says, is this is self-evident to me, then yeah. you, know, you, you wonder how strong yeah. it is. It is exactly the same. We repeat, you know, uh, all men are born equal, you know, and you are constitutionalist. Uh, I will fight for constitution. Yeah. 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 It okay. seems to me you disagree with me. <laughs> 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 you, it is exactly the same, you know. It's all based on common definitions because the definition of man yeah. uh, has to be common if it's to be, and it wasn't common. Yeah. What it was common was that man was black and it wasn't woman. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It you see, it is applicable then. exactly. The, but, you know, the mathematics was this the superior structure. Up to now, you know, we, we kind of shake uh, it's better, uh, you know. We, uh, <laughs> Isn't geometry set up that way? That you list the axioms and then you, from all these definitions, then you go into, uh, you know, describing the, yeah, the particulars. Uh, yes. Yeah. But now, can you imagine that there will be some, some day, in some country, somebody who will rebel. You can imagine, like David Hume, you know. There was a, a monk, Italian monk, Saceri, in 17th century, who had doubts about it, you know. And he dared to mention it only to few close friends, you know. He had doubts, you know, about the whole foundation of mathematics based on axioms. He felt that maybe some of these axioms are not so clear, distinct, self-evident. But in front of professors, you know, he did not dare to state it, you know. So it will take another 
200 years until the time of great German mathematician uh, <coughs> Gauss. He himself was not sure, you know. To, he didn't want to announce it. So he had brilliant students. One of them was Hung Hungarian, Bolai. The other one was Russian, Lobachevsky. The third one was German, Riemann. They were young. So th he told them, you know, maybe these axioms are not so clear, this thing. Now, but don't quote me. Don't, <laughs> no, no. don't, 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 don't quote. Qu and these were youngsters who wanted to be famous, you know. They went out and produced a different system than Euclidean geometry. So all of a sudden you have three systems, Bolayan, Lobachevskian, and Riemannian. Supposedly there was supposed to be only one geometry. Now you have four. It is clear that axioms are assumptions. So the big game is over. What is an assumption? What I assume. Can you have assumption? I think you can too. You too. You can have assumption. But we have different systems different systems of thinking. I am born free to have my own assumptions. But the, you see how far it goes politically, religiously, scientifically, philosophically. This is a completely new game. Isn't language itself, uh, you look at the whole uh, conflicting in, in uh, uh, reality around you. Uh, in order to understand it, you break it into little pieces yeah. and, and you attach words to it. And then all the people in society agree that that yeah. word means that thing. Yeah. And you create the thing, in a sense, by general agreement yes. of, about what the words mean. Yeah. But how close that describes reality is kind of arbitrary, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly arbitrary. This arbitrariness is scary, you know, for people. The implications are so tremendous, you know. And then if you go from one culture to another yes, culture, yeah. they use different words. Yeah. And from the words, they make assumptions, yeah, yeah. which make it different. You know, here is the freedom. Here is the freedom of assumptions underlying our thinking. You know. I'm afraid this is not what was in mind of our founding fathers. It was a long time before Gauss, and Gauss himself, brilliant man, he was afraid to. Hume was not afraid, you know, but he suffered more. <laughs> but can you have a society uh, without an agreement among all the people within yeah, it? Yeah that uh, all men are created equal. Yeah. They have to agree to yeah. that. And then you said it's this, you know, make laws and all yeah. this yeah. behavior based on this assumption. But it, whether it has really any reality or not, it's, you know, you're wondering where, where it comes from, yeah. you know, aside from agreement. Yeah. People. You see how weak mm, yeah. the whole thinking background of our constitution is. Of course, you know, in this class, you, will, you won't bring it out. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 There's also the matter that, uh, of the fact that language itself evolves and words can mean different things at different times. <laughs> yeah. But the, the implications are for everything, you know. The freedom is of each individual to have his own view, assumptions, be aware that he's building his view of the world on his 
own assumptions. Of course, this is tremendous implication, we know, for science, religion, philosophy, for everything. Can we live with it? Man is striving for certainty, you see. Yeah. So you killed the ones that just don't agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, because they're yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <It's certainty. laughs> So it is, you see this idol of mathematics was uh, practically destroyed, the t traditional, but we have a new strength in it, you know. If you discover the freedom each of you have, this is the tr true freedom and liberty which we have. But uncertainty, connected with uncertainty, you know. In 20th century, for the first time in our Western tradition, we have a man who formulated principle of uncertainty. He was not crucified for it, you know, yeah. and he was, I'm proud, I was in his seminar, Werner Heisenberg, and he formulated limits of our knowledge, principle of uncertainty, and his close colleague in Copenhagen, uh, Niels Bohr, formulated a uh, principle which discontinued two valued system, principle of complementarity, something unknown to our Western tradition, because everything was based on Aristotelian two valued system which is deeply built into each of us, just like this concept of uh, axiom. Aristotle formulated laws of Western deductive logic based on three laws. Identity, excluded middle, and uh, identity, non-contradiction, and excluded middle. So everything is identical. A is A. You could not build a logical system unless you accept identity A is always A. Out of this identity principle law of Aristotle exists second principle, non-contradiction. A and non-A is not the case, it cannot be the case. A first. A and not A cannot be. A and not K is not the case. And the third law Either, either A or non-A, not, not both, either or, you see, everything has to be either or. And this, this is what buzzes in our heads, in a way we are born with it, you know, in the West. I don't know how our mothers pumped it into us. Our mothers very seldom know about these three laws. And, but it was so deeply in all of us, in our religion. We know two value system, you see, in science. You prove or disprove. So it was at the beginning of 20th century when thinkers associated with quantum physics in Copenhagen dared to 
negate this third one. They excluded, excluded middle. <laughs> you see? When you exclude, excluded middle, uh, this is what was said to Bohr, Niels Bohr. You see, it is very similar like in the Chinese philosophy, you know. In this Chinese philosophy, in the Western, it is A and, and non-A. It cannot be the case. And in, in this Taoist philosophy, everything is included. And Niels Bohr, who uh, this is a mistake of many of our Western thinkers. They think that he learned it from Taoists, you know. He had nothing to do with Oriental philosophy. He discovered the very principle in his thinking about quantum, foundation of quantum physics. After he was told about Taoists, off he went. Let's go to China. He went to China, you know, to learn. He had nothing to learn there, but he was amazed that 2,000 years ago, you know, they had this concept at the time when Aristotle was beating, you know, this two-valued system into our Western structure of thinking. Chinese had this Taoist complementary way of thinking, which changes the way you look at the world. It gives you different glasses, how you sort things in the world. Uh, so when we, when we go into, back into Middle Ages, we see the foundation of universities. These universities, out of seven liberal arts, produce four faculties. Again, this is the global view, Mathesis Universalis. These four faculties will be four bodies of the university which will comprise the entire universe through which you can study the entire universe. Faculty of Philosophy, second. Faculty of Law, Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Theology. So each university on the continent, as it started, Bologna, University of Bologna, University of Paris, University of Prague, University of Heidelberg, in order to be university, they have to have these four faculties. Students who will be admitted, and this is one very important aspect of Continental University. There is a selective notion underlying education. Not everybody will study, you know. Educational system is not a cube. Then you, from kindergarten, you carry everybody up to PhD. You know. Continental system is a triangle with elimination. So these universities with four faculties did not teach the whole nation. They taught only those, this is Plato's triangle, who were eliminated, eliminated, and at the end only the peak reaches this universal knowledge. And then they can specialize, you know, but they have to have the wide background within which they specialize. There is no specialization for the sake of specialization. 
you can specialize only within the largest possible structure. This is the difference also between British and later American system. University uh, schools like gymnasium is an elite school which translated very often as high school. But high school, American high school is product of cube. Continental gymnasium traditionally is a triangle. When you leave continental middle school, you are well versed in world history, your own history, your own geography, world geography. This is the basic you have to know. It can never happen, you know, that you produce a soldier who goes to Iraq and doesn't know where it is. And, and when he's in Korea, he doesn't know where it is. He wants to go home. He's very unhappy. Why is that? You see, this is not the purpose of our education, you know, to give the largest possible framework to people. By the way, what happened in Afghanistan uh, recently, this is the byproduct of it. And I'm familiar, you know, with the cases uh, from Korea during Korean War. I read the studies, Russian studies, investigating American soldiers who got into captivity after they attacked uh, North Korea. Russians were collecting many of the American soldiers. Um, Try to find out the psychology education, education they have. I read the studies. It's awful, you know, to just to read it. Our soldiers disclose everything, you know. They, they smell the c cigarette, you know. They came to be investigated, and, and the Russians smoked a cigarette who was blowing the uh, smoke into their face. And they both, or started a, a, a shaver. The shaver was running. They were able, to, they were willing to say everything about secrets of the army. They admitted they didn't know where they were, why they were there. They wanted to be back at home, you know, with their dear ones. They don't know why they were sent to Korea. So if you read studies like this, it tells you, you know, that there is something wrong we are doing in our educational system. And so the, we produce specialists too early. What we need a solid foundation in basic training of the mind, basic knowledge of the world, history, world history, geography, then other mathematics. This is thinking, free thinking, being able to decipher, you know, where we are coming from, what are these laws, axioms, and So the, the universities during the late Middle Ages laid down the foundation for Western development. Uh, there were two great universities in England, Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, later in 19th century, it was revitalized by uh, Cardinal Newman, who had deep interest in foundation solid foundation of British learning. 
he was fully aware of what happened uh, with empiricism, that British people have to start educating the people, you know, in general culture of the world, especially since they are imperial nation, since they have colonies. They cannot go into colonies, you know, just believing what they found empirically around them in, in England. And they succeeded. They were producing elite. So evidently, elitist education on the continent was copied as elitist education at Cambridge and Oxford. The question remains how far we can get with education of everybody. This is a noble goal of American education, to educate everybody. Could it mean that it is equal to educating nobody? <laughs> and this is a serious problem we see now. Just listen to our political scene. These are the leaders who are going to lead us, uh, who have never been anywhere in the world, who have problems with basic geography. Not only the world, but United States. So. So there is something wrong we are doing. And this is the implication, you know, of this traditional emphasis on educational system. This concept of continental universities was elitist. You know, I remember when I escaped to Austria and the system of education was the same all over Europe. Since I had gymnasium, I was able to study anywhere on the continent, automatically. It was, it was expected that I know foreign languages, Latin, Little Greek, I know world history. So I am accepted automatically in Austrian university of course, provided I speak German. And I had friends who came from the United States. I helped them to get registered at the university. And they did not speak German. They wanted to study psychology because psychology was preferred field in the 50s. So I introduced them to the dean and ask them to let them in. And they speak English with him, with the dean. And, and I convinced the dean just to let them in and give him a chance to learn German. And I never forget uh, one close friend from San Francisco. He was nervous. Uh, he, the dean asked him, what do you want to study here? He asked him, German University in English. He says, I want to study Russian journalism. And he says, you know, we don't teach Russian journalism. You have to learn history, history of religion, philosophy, economics. No, no, I want to Russian journalism. He said, no, we don't teach it here. And he was nervous, you know. I want to specialize in Russian journalism. He said, it doesn't exist here. And he was so nervous, he pulled out a cigarette and started, uh, you know, uh, in his office. And he pulled a, uh, a pack of cigarettes and asked the dean, Rauchst du? in German. Rauchst du? And, and, you know, this is what he knew in German. <laughs> Rauchst du, you know. This is, you know, this difference between Z and, uh, yeah. and do, 
and the, the dean was all shaken, you know, that somebody would dare to call him like a boy, you know, around. He says, no, 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 no. In English, I don't smoke, you know. <laughs> so it was embarrassing, you know. <laughs> but he wanted to study Russian journalism. It took him 20 years to learn it when I later was meeting him in San Francisco that you cannot study Russian journalism like that, you know, a specialty. Here you can study any specialty, you know, without the larger background. So this is the basic, basic difference. Then, uh, traditional concept of university was preparing you in achieving as a young man and woman a world view which incorporates everything, sciences, humanities, social sciences, religion, general culture. So you are educated man provided you have developed this world view. So the goal of education is to have a world view. My colleagues here at the university told me, told me, when I talk about it for the last 50 years, it's impossible to have a world view. How can you have a world view? You know, when uh, I study geology, you know, I'm so busy studying geology, I don't have time to do anything else. And, and you talk about world view. You have to approach it differently. And still, after all these years, it is impossible. You know, in our context of education, it is impossible. Uh, because we don't believe that human mind can comprise, you know, this worldview. Yeah, so here is, uh, you know, Greeks had a, a, a great, great uh, saying, hic rodus, hic salta, when uh, Rhodus was an island, and whenever there was a problem, they said, this is a real problem. Here you have to jump. Hic rodus, hic salta. Do you remember? Yeah. Hic rodus, hic salta. This is hic rodus. We can jump here, if we can. I have a question. Uh, <coughs> English university system, what about... They're in contrast with the Scottish philosophers <coughs> and the Scottish philosophers, and Locke is one of those. Yeah. And, and when do they uh, submit to more of the Scottish philosophy? I mean, and what happened to Edinburgh? Edinburgh was the home of the Scottish philosophy. Yes, you know, Scott, Scottish people were Catholics mostly, you know. So they were getting, you know, uh, the educational philosophy uh, through Catholic sources. And Hume had it, it brilliant, all brilliant Scotsman, you know, Napier in mathematics, you know, in, in all fields, you know, they had problem in their society. Just like you have a problem in our society, you know, whenever you get away, like uh, those who didn't believe in axioms, you know, they had problems. University did not give them a job. So in order to get a job, you have to collaborate with people, you know, who are in the, you know, when I came here and asked for a job, uh, I asked President Patty to teach philosophy. He said, my God. Can you make something that would make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was President Patty. And I, well, what do you understand under making sense? You know, you know in post-Putnik era, uh, we need somebody who will teach German or, or French or Russian. I said, no, you know, I, I speak German. I speak Russian. So I was examined, I uh, given a job to teach languages, and he could not help to tell me 
forget your damn philosophy. <laughs> he was a minor. You know, University of Alaska started a school of mines and school of agriculture, you see? Yes. But the name university, it has nothing to do with the university. Probably still it does not. <laughs> you know, university, by the way, made a, made a film. They feel sorry probably for it. <laughs> and those of you who have not seen it, uh, it was made by the university by Dan O'Neill. You know Dan O'Neill? Um, it, it can be found on YouTube, on Facebook, on uh, iPod and iPhone. It is Dr. Rudy Krejci, philosopher and rebel. <laughs> and rebel. So on YouTube, on, on YouTube, you know, Dr. Rudy Krejci, philosopher and rebel. And uh, he will never receive any award uh, uh, Dan O'Neill, you know, in Alaska, you know, for his, for his achievement as a journalist and filmmaker. And we have uh, here our great filmmaker, Mr. Owl, who collaborated, who made the film, you know, and so, but you know, they award you, you know, I think I was ignored most of my life at the university by upper echelon because uh, presidents didn't like me. And, <laughs> and I tried to use plain language and, and say it, things how they were. And, Oh, if you want to survive, don't follow me. <laughs> okay. I, I was just thinking of uh, the conflict between a worldview as opposed to specialty. Yeah. And uh, I think that somehow you have to go up and down the scale. Yes, and yes. I, I was thinking of Darwin and how he spent years studying the barnacle and, yeah. you know, and, and more and more and more detail. Yeah, yeah. And then he, he sat back and he says, aha, and yeah. he comes out with a natural selection and yes, other yeah. the theory of uh, yeah, evolution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you have to go up and down. Yes, if you stay down at the worldview, no. then it's so broad yeah. that nothing happens. Yeah. You, know? you know, Charles Darwin had theory of evolution in his rucksack when he left. You know, and what we interpreted, he went, you know, on eagle, and he was looking and collecting empirically, you know, and putting everything together. You know, he had it in his rucksack in England as a hypothesis. And he went on his trip on eagle just to confirm his hypothesis. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So amen. <laughs> <laughs>